Thank you so much, folks, for coming and joining us for another Chesapeake Conversations. We're really excited to be here celebrating with you uh, this in, uh, National Indigenous Heritage Month and taking some time to explore together what place-based spirituality is, how we can apply it to our own lives and incorporate it into our own faithful practices. So before we get too far along, I wanna take some time to do a land acknowledgement to recognize not only the first peoples, but the land and waters which they occupied and still occupy. The Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake recognizes that together, recognizes together that the North American story does not begin with the colonial era, but rather with the arrival of the first people thousands of years before. Their stories, wisdom, and ingenuity have helped to define who we are and do continue to shape what our nation will become. Today and all days, we honor our country's future by recognizing our shared past. With help, Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake has prepared a statement honoring our commitment to the indigenous communities of the Chesapeake region, recognizing the lands and waters where these communities once flourished. We hope you will join us in this silent reflection. Today, we wish to hold space for silent reflection on and gratitude for the land upon which we live and the local waters that support and nourish us all. We recognize that this land and these waters were stewarded by many who came before. The original people believed they belonged to these lands and waters, not the other way around. Their spiritual, spirituality and identity were place-based. The stories these indigenous people, plants and animals, lands and rivers witnessed are filled with environmental, social, and climate changes interwoven with stories of struggles, injustices, and resilience. We reflect together as people of faith in response to the calling of our hearts to come alongside the original stewards of this land and these waters that sustain us all. We seek to change the narrative of this story, our story, towards one of harmony with the gifts of creation and all living beings. Our hearts are full of hope as we come together with honor for all of life. We hope you will take time with us though to explore the indigenous communities that once occupied your region. We have a resource that we're gonna be adding into the, to the chat that not only recaps the reflection I've just shared, but it shares a link in which you can explore some of the cultures and societies and people who once occupied the place that you stand today. I encourage you deeply to learn more about the people who were there before you so that you can connect with the land that you currently reside upon. And so that carries me then to, hi, my name is Taylor Swanson and I work for a group called Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake. We help faithful stewards of any faith of any denomination across the watershed to care better for their sacred waterways. We help to form teams that we then hope can carry forward stewardship messages to connect their people, both in the pews and their communities to their waterways. And so if you're sitting here and you're not part of Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake's uh, mission towards the Chesapeake Bay yet, we encourage you to join us. If you can go to the next slide, please. There are over 150 congregations now that have signed a definitive commitment alongside others to, to help support the Chesapeake Bay and the work we're doing towards sacred waterway. We've engaged with over 400 congregations of faith now across the Chesapeake. And this is the, the, the portion that has now signed our pledge. We deeply encourage anyone in this room who hasn't considered this yet, uh, as a meaningful step towards engaging your congregation and community at large on faithful actions. Our congregations have now completed hundreds of actions, including educational workshops, much like ours tonight, uh, advocacy efforts, and in the ground projects that are helping to treat stormwater before it enters the Chesapeake Bay. If you're eager and excited about this, but don't yet have a team, don't worry. We also have a program that helps communities come together and form a team so that they can take on this work. We found definitively that our congregations that have a team get more done and that everything is easier when you have support. So if this is of interest to you and getting involved and taking a bigger step towards environmental action at your own congregation is of interest to you, I strongly encourage you to reach out to your IPC coordinator and to learn more about this training session and what it might mean for you. I wanna finally leave you with a few words before I get to introduce our wonderful speaker for tonight which comes from one of our congregations in Baltimore, from the Still Meadow Community Fellowship. And these words come from Pastor Michael Martin, who is the overseer, the pastor, for a congregation that uh, holds about three acres, four acres of land in urban Baltimore. 
They are surrounded on all sides by blacktop pavement, housing developments, and, and mowed lawns of all kinds. They had a stream that was very inundated with both uh, in the water problems and invasives and other uh, problematic species around them. They, as a community, have come together to revitalize their woodland and their stream. They've identified that they could have a powerful change onto their community. To date, they've removed thousands of pounds of invasive species, have planted an equal number, thousands of trees into the property, and have begun working with upstream and downstream congregational allies to help better the water quality before it comes to their property. Pastor Michael Martin said this though, he said, I don't know how to change the country and I don't know how to change the world, but I do know how to have an impact in my neighborhood where my parish is. Without realizing it, Pastor Michael Martin captured the theme of our, our webinar tonight, which is exploring what is place-based spirituality and how we can apply that to our own lives. Pastor Michael Martin, I didn't. Oh, and Bonnie is correcting me. The Peace Park is actually 10 acres, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, a, a, it's an interesting plot of land because it might only be 100 feet wide, 300 feet wide, and it's long. It's a section where Baltimore wouldn't even buy the property back to develop it. But what Pastor Michael Martin did is he became an expert in his corner of the world. He became an expert on his waterway, and he doesn't care. He does care, but he doesn't need to know what's going on in Anne Arundel County where I am or on the eastern shore where Molly Rudo is. He knows his neighborhood, and he knows his water, and he knows how to help connect people to his water. And so without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, which is Ruth Ann Purchase. Ruth Ann is the founder of the Lipstick River Watershed Association, Greenbridge Community Development Corporation, and Friends of Lenape Everywhere. Ruth Ann lives and works in the Lenape Indian Tribe of Delaware Federal Census District as a cultural mapping project manager, and with the Native American House Alliance in Philadelphia as an outreach coordinator. She's truly all over the Bay and all over the Delaware Bay, and we cannot, we could not be more thrilled that she's here tonight with her family and others to help us explore this uh, concept of what is place-based spirituality. So Ruthann, please, we have to test you. Wanishi, Wanishi Wemi, Welenkuntuwakan, Achnulam Hitawananak. This is the ancient language of the Lenape people. Who, who lived on this Delaware Peninsula, the Delmarva Peninsula, and all the way up into New York State, all the way to Connecticut. It was such a big language group. And tonight with me, I have Simon, who has been uh, working as a volunteer coordinator in our Lenape Forest Garden, but he also sings in the uh, beauty of nature. And we have our sweat lodge leader, our big brother and cousin, Walter Durham, who has lived all his life in the Lenape Federal Census District and comes with many stories. And I've asked him to specifically mention something about his um, playing of the spiritual flute. So we'll do a little of that later. And now I'd like to share the, the talking stick with Simon a little bit so he can bring us into a moment of reflection on where we are and the depth of our relationship to our place. Anishi, thank you. Thank you for being here, Walter. Thank you for hosting this, uh, Taylor, and thank you all for being here with us. <clears throat> One of the teachings that I often encourage people to take to heart is one that can be learned from many places, but Robin Wall Kimmerer of the Potawatomi Nation um, teaches it eloquently in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is that when we learn to live together well with all our relations, our relations include all of Mother Earth's inhabitants, not just our human brothers and sisters and cousins, um, but our family extends and the circle of citizenship extends to the waterways, to the clouds, to the winged ones, to the two-legged and the four-legged, to the creepy crawlies that live under the soil, um, to, to the fish people, um, to the plant people, to the medicine people, to the tree people. And, and we must, in order to be in relationship with our place, learn to be in relationship of reciprocity 
and of familiarity with all of Mother Earth's inhabitants around us um, so that we may learn how to honor and relate to them uh, with dignity, knowing that it is part of our duty to speak for them in language that we have and listen for the teachings that they have to share with us because they are amazing teachers and in, uh, in the Lenape tradition and in Robin Wall Kimmerer's people's traditions, they are considered our elders. We are just youth on this earth compared to the trees, compared to the mushrooms, compared to the sturgeon, uh, compared to the horseshoe crabs. We are, we are the young ones in this family. Um, so it is important to honor them as our elders and as great teachers and as integral to our life on this beautiful peninsula and on these beautiful waterways. Did you want to bring some music? I'd be happy to if you'd like me to share yeah. a song. Yeah. Be here now? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, let's move that. Um, I was asked if I would share one of my original songs, which is, um, I hope the guitar and my voice will come through well at the same time. This is a song called Be Here Now that I wrote <clears throat> a few years ago. Um, and it's a mixture of, of influences, but it's very much about being present to where we are and honoring each other and this story that we share. Awake my soul and clear the smog moving inward and outward as children of God celebrate each other as the great transition moves come back to the garden as carbon and changing yet you and be here now where ripples form be here now be here now and be here now where light moves be here now be here now together friends don't shatter and sleep emerging now with the powerful voice we speak it's time to heal to fear is to feel nothing less and we are blessed to be here now where ripples form be here now be here now you're welcome to sing along if you're on mute to be here now so be here now where light moves where light moves be here now be here now we'll sing that all together one more time at the end we are learning what it is we've always known we are golden billions of years old we are old Yes, older than our years, we are stardust mixed with our grandmother's tears. We are here now, where ripples form. We are here now, we are here now. So be here now, where light moves. Where light moves, be here now, be here now, one more time, be here now, be here now, where ripples form, where ripples form, be here now, be here now, be here now, where light moves, where light moves. 
be here now. Oh, be here now. Manishi Simon. So that brings us to our thought for today. How do we honor and respect faith traditions, spirituality that is place based here now? Nulintanam Eli Paik is how we say welcome. We're glad you came. We are here now in Lenape Hokink and in the region of the Piscataway and all the tribal names that the Chesapeake Bay celebrate. We're here now in an ancient, ancient way in an ancient, ancient land. And our concept of ourselves is humbled in the timeline of a river. So with that, I'd like Taylor to move us forward and guide our conversation a little bit. Chief Quiet Thunder is a dear friend and family member and all three of us here tonight, Simon Walter and I have spent just amazing, beautiful time with him. He recently passed away, but he left us this beautiful message. It's only one and a half minutes, so listen carefully. It's it's so deep, but it's quick. They mimic as much of nature as they possibly could because that's where all their knowledge, and everything they knew came from nature. They were in nature every day of their lives. And uh, that set their stage each morning from the days when they would step from their wigwam go to the stream and cleanse themselves and then turn to the east. And as the sun would rise, they would pray. Now, Europeans said that we were praying to the sun as the sun god, but that's not true. What is true, we could see God's power manifested in that huge ball of fire and light and warmth and the promise of a new day. But we could see God's power manifested in the wind, the rain, the snow, the mountains, and all of creation. All of creation. And they they knew where they fit into that balance. And that's what's missing today. Man has got himself get so superior in his thinking that he's superior to nature. Can't be superior to something that without it you don't exist. So what is place-based spirituality? It is recognizing that we are small and that we are but a strand in the web of life and that only being present, fully present and grateful is our sacred obligation with respect for all life as sacred. Um, I would like to um, just allow our sweat lodge leader, Walter Durham, to share a little bit, if this is a good time. Taylor, is that all right? What did this... That would be wonderful. What did this song or this message from Chief Quiet Thunder bring to your well, mind, or what would you like to share with us? What he's trying to tell you is our relationship to the land is... <clears throat> Our ancestors are here. When you look at that river, I don't just see the river. I fished that river ever since I was a little kid. And my ancestors before me when they were little kids and theirs before them. So our relationship to the river is a whole lot different than what people think it is. It's not just the river to us. It's a way of life. 
and we're not always connected to the river. We're connected to the forest the same way, and all the creepy crawlers and the, the four leggers that live in the forest. We have to get back to that, which we had was already here. The gift that we had, we already had it already. We are the ones that left it. It never left us. It's always going to be there. But you have to be willing inside yourself to take away the materialistic part of you that makes you think you better than the little creepy crawler or the wiggle or whatever it is that the creator made. All things are sacred that the creator made because it all makes up part of creation. But in our greed and selfishness, and especially today, we tend to fall away from what should be instead of what appears to be. See, there's an illusion that we create for ourselves. You have to sometimes look through that. It's like being in the fall, being the fall clears. And wow, where all this come from? But it was already there already. You just was bonded by bondage. You couldn't see it. And when you go to the ocean and you see, you say, wow, look, at there's a whale. How many times do you see a whale? But that's another part of creation. And he probably says, look, there's a human. How many times does he see a human? You see, you got to look at his point of view. Because he was already there already. We are the ones that change, like the four legs in the woods. You cut down all the forests, where are they going to go live at? That's right right now. They have no place to go. The deers are running around now. They, they don't know what's happening. The turkey's saying, hey, what's going on, man? It was, a, it was a forest here yesterday. Now it's a housing development. Is it really worth all that? What we're going to have to give up to what we're going to get when we can just go back to being? Why do we got to have all this big? You got one car. Some people got five cars. How many can you drive at one time? You got you got all these shoes. Some people got a hundred pairs of shoes. You can't wear but one pair at a time. Some people ain't got no shoes, but they forget that when they look, they don't see that. That's what Uncle Rich to try to tell people. Always be in harmony to those around you because you. You don't know what you're dealing with, and you don't know what people's thinking about or how their feelings are. So always try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes first. And then as time goes on, you will learn to reflect on what actually is around you. And today especially, with all our people, it doesn't matter the faith. It's what you believe in the creator who gave you life in the beginning. You already know the creator's there. Or we wouldn't be here. None of these things would be here without the creator. The rivers wouldn't be here. The air wouldn't be here. There wouldn't nothing be here. But if you cut down the trees, what you going to breathe? You know, where are we going to go live at? We only have one earth. We can't go move somewhere else and tear it up too. Why don't we just straighten up what we got already? But it's going to take time because oil companies want to make gas so you can ride up and down the road. Well, it was fine when the horses was pulling us up and down the road, but technology came and you had to advance yourself. What have we, are we any more along better now than we was before we had all this? Actually, are we or are we not? When you look at what you have done over through our substance and our greed for materialistic things, we have destroyed the rivers. We dammed them up. That's the beaver's job. Let him dam them up. He knows what he's doing. There's a reason why he dams it up. It was no reason for us to dam it up only because we wanted to change the path of the river. Well, sometimes you can't change the past of the river because that river's flowed there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It's like your heart pumping in your chest. Boom, 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 boom. It's a story that's good to tell. And when you look at the four-legged and the two-legged stand-up people of Turtle Island and all the green plant people and the fish people and the fast swimmers who live in the ocean rivers, lakes, and ponds. See, there you are back to the ocean rivers, lakes, and ponds again. These are the things where life was created in the beginning. You can look at how you want, why you think our ties to the water is so strong, because most of us are water people. We live in the water all our lives. We have a relationship to the fish. We have a relationship to the shellfish that goes on there. We have a relationship to the plants that grow and all things that we use around us, because we learn to share. If you see the eagle there on the bank, you leave him a fish, you'll always catch one. You can say what you want to say, but if you leave that you give one, you always catch another one. That's all you got to remember. But what you give away today, come back to you tomorrow. It's the same way in life. You plant that seed that you're planting right now with what you're trying to do. You're planting the seed, and your seed's going to grow. Now you got to learn to nourish your, feed, your seed so it can prosper. Now we want fruit to come off of us so all of our people can learn to taste of this. 
inside their heart. See, it's more than what you can see or perceive. That's what Cry Thunder tried to get across to people, the message of we are just humble people. We are no better or no greater than anybody or anything that the creator made. And we have to learn to recognize in our own self. When a man takes a wife, he makes a circle for himself. And as time goes on, he opens a circle and his brothers come with their wives and he makes a bigger circle. But every once in a while, another person comes along and he makes a bigger circle and includes all the people. And then when you go again, another man may come along and he takes all the people's responsibility upon himself. And then you look at yourself and you ask, are you one of those people? Are you ready to take on the responsibilities of all things, not just the two-legged people, but also the four-legged and the wing ones and all who have came behind us and those who are coming towards us? Because it ain't about us. It's about them walking towards us. It's about the little children who ain't even got here yet. Because when the creator created all the flowers, did he make them all the same? No, he didn't. He made all the flowers different colors and different sizes and different shapes. Though their beauty shine together. It's just like them little smiles on them little children. They don't learn these prejudices and things until they grow up and learn them from those who show them how to be ignorant. But when you have knowledge and you have acceptance of what things are instead of what they appear to be and what they are in your heart. See, because the truth you can stand on. But a false truth is worthless. So as we walk in these days and you people to have these strengths, don't let nothing deter you from what you're doing because it's right in your heart. That's where you live. That's your house. We sweep our house. And all of us together, if we clean our house, pretty soon we'll have a clean place to live, won't we? <laughs> if we all do it together. But today is fast. Fast food, fast everything. They don't have time. They don't have time to do anything. Got to hurry up and get there. See, we're on Indian time. <laughs> Don't make no difference to me. I'm going to get there sooner or later. It ain't going to matter enough. Sun came up. It's going to go down. Moon is going to take its place. And look, in the morning, if I'm still living, we're going to start it all over again. They don't realize that. They got to grab it right now when it's already there. How are you going to grab hold of something that's already yours? Like I try to explain about the land. Do you walk on the land or do the land walk on you? Uh-uh. You belong to it. It don't belong to you. That's what they don't understand. Oh, we can, that, that's my property over there. So I'm afraid not, there's not your, no more of your property there than that is over there. That property is your ancestors that came before you here with us in our community. That's why it means so much to us when we go by and I look out the window and I say, I used to rabbit hunt there. And there's 1,500 houses there now. And there ain't even a place for a man to have a yard for the kids to play in. You got to look at this. And this is right here in Kenton, right here in Delaware right now. It's crowned us in like this here. The Seamy boy used to own all that land over there. It's gone. It's all housing developments. Daddy's land is all gone. Somebody else owned it. They won't even let you walk on your own ancestral ground. Because these are the things that we got to get away from and get back to nature that we're all brothers and sisters, regardless if we have feathers or if we have gills or whatever it is, or we wiggle or whatever. We still connect it to the land. And the land is connected to us because regardless of how we think of it, we have to have a relationship with our mother to her because after all, she is our mother. <laughs> right or wrong. And we have relationships with our mother, all of us do. So that's why we always call the earth our mother because she nurses us and she protects us. And she provides these things, even though when we're negative and we're dumping thousands of gallons of whatever it is into the ocean. The earth don't say, hey, what are you doing? She don't jump up in the air and say, she ought to. But <laughs> maybe she is, and we ain't paying attention with all these hurricanes and storms that we're having. Maybe she's trying to tell us, hey, don't you think maybe I had enough? But maybe you ain't hearing. So maybe I might have to get louder, or you might not be able to see. So, you know, maybe it's our responsibility to wake them up and say, hey, we got nowhere else to live. This is the planet Earth that the Creator made for us. He gave us natives responsibility 
to keep this earth. And we, somewhere down the line, got misdirected or our, our meaning was not taken seriously and nobody cared, so we didn't care either. Maybe we thought that our gods rejected us and we ran and hid from ourselves. But one thing we should have remembered that the earth has always been here and she never left us. She always here. The moon always there, the sun always there. And the river that flows is always there. Even though it's been altered and changed, maybe run this way or run that way, it's still the same. Because there's only so much water and so much land, regardless of where it's at at any one time. And that's what they got to realize, that the earth has a perfect balance with nature and whatever else goes on. But man has came with his selfishness and his this hole that he has in his heart for materialistic. He can't never get enough. No matter what he gets, he still won't never have enough because he can't never fill that void because he can never find true meaning of what it means to be free of materialistic things. You have to set yourself free like you have being baptized in church and being free from these materialistic things that bind you to the earth. Well, it's the same way in our culture when we go into the sweat lodge and we reborn again. We renew ourselves so we can have that energy to provide. But we have all these things today. You know, you have diabetes, you have cancer, you have, you have many difficulties in the room. But if your heart is pure, hey, this is on this side here. This is just on the worldly side. This is of the flesh. Now we're going to speak in terms of the spirit. Which is a great thing because all, even the creepy crawlers have spirits, even though you can't see them, don't mean they don't have none. It don't mean that they're not all connected because if you look at the ant people and watch how they communicate amongst themselves, they have a sophisticated society, just like the bees and all the rest of them that are here for a purpose. Without them, we can't exist. Without the bees to pollinate our food, how are we going to eat? We don't understand these things, but it's so. And it's not for us to ask why, because that was the creator's job. That's why he is. his job is to create. Ours is to make sure it stays here in our acceptance of what is and what appears to be. See, you look at the river, some people only see a river flowing. Oh, that's no dirty water. I ain't getting in there. Well, let's look past the water. Let's look at what lives in the water. Let's look at the mussels and the fish and the ducks and the geese. And all the different parts of creation, that four-legged drink of the water, they bathe in the water. The raccoons and critters play in the water. Mustrats live in the water. Beavers live in the water. And they're four-legged. But their relationship to the land doesn't ever change. Do you see the four-legged out here trying to, there's not squirrels trying to be rabbits saying, hey, I'm a rabbit. He knows he's a squirrel. <laughs> he already hangs out with nuts, so he knows he's a squirrel already. And with, with us, man has a choice. See, he can do whatever he wants to do. The animals don't have no choice. They got to do what his will to do. There is a difference. Man has a free will. He has a choice. Other ones don't have that choice. See, that's why man thinks he's in dominant over all the things. But anyway, with that there, I'm going to get ready and let it go. But I'm, I'm glad that you welcomed me here. And I don't want to keep going because, you know, it, it goes on forever. The story never ends. <laughs> Because every day is a new story. Every morning when you go somewhere else and meet new people, your chapter, it's like this circle I'm telling you about where these people are coming. Your, your family gets a little bit bigger, like ours have now. We're communicating with all your different faiths, and you're trying to build a structure. But you're still on the same planet, and you're still on your same center of the universe, is what I'm going to say. That is your center. Wherever you are right now, if you draw a circle around yourself, that is just center of the universe right there. And you build off of that. Then, you, like I said, you open your door and you, you bring your family into your circle. So then your family grows like ours used to. And, of course, our families would be spread all down the East Coast. But at certain times of the year, at the solstice and the equinoxes, we came together to celebrate these things. And we came from all over. But somehow we forgot that. And it, it got less meaning. It wasn't as meaningful as it was back then to do it now. Now we only do it out of, I don't know, maybe force of habit instead of from the heart. But that's what we're trying to bring back is our celebrations and our things that go in harmony with nature. 
because you have to have one goes with the other. They go together in harmony back and forth. If we have a terrible winter, maybe some of the animals might not make it, but that renewal of life in the springtime guarantees that it will all start all over again eventually if we just have faith in ourselves. So with that, I give you that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, um, I don't really want to add anything to that. I just want to rest with it. Taylor, do you have any reflection or would you like to move us along? Sure, happily, we can move into our activity now because I think it connects really nicely with what was just said and, and focusing on our relationships with, with our own piece of the bay and, and our own piece of the water and land around us. So Ruthann and I are going to walk everyone in here through a, uh, through a short exercise that we hope will we hope that you will participate in, whether actively in our chat or uh, with, your, with your own mind and your own seat at home. But we want to explore some of our own watershed stories here in the room and explore our places around the watershed. We want to go back to what Pastor Michael Martin said at the beginning of our presentation, that you can be an expert on your own corner of the watershed, that you should take ownership over what you can do at your own neighborhood, your own parish, your own community, your own congregation. And so as we go through, we're gonna show different scenes from the watershed, if you will, exploring upstream to downstream, urban waters to marshes and swamps. We'll give you imagery that will hopefully elicit feelings that will remind you of your place in the watershed and what you have experienced here in the watershed. We encourage you to either raise your hand, unmute yourself or share in the chat pieces of your own relationship, stories of your own relationship with water that relate to the images we'll show you, or pieces of your rights and responsibilities to those same waterways, pieces that you've focused on. So I'll introduce our first one now, which is taking a look upstream in the bay. I want to elicit feelings of being in the furthest corners of New York or West Virginia, mountain streams and Shenandoah out in Virginia or Maryland, maybe a trout stream in New York. If your imagination's good, remove the rocks and maybe you could imagine Harford or Anne Arundel or Eastern Shore streams traveling across the land. Please share anything you want in the chat, raise your hand and offer us a story of a moment you've had in the watershed. We'll only have a couple minutes on each. We do really encourage everyone to share. I have some wonderful memories of birding on streams just like this. I can't hear the sound of babbling water without thinking of warblers and other songbirds and thrushes in the mountains. It's my own connection. Ruthann, did you have one that you'd love to help? Well, well this, this picture right here reminds me of where I grew up camping. So I didn't grow up with a lot of science understanding or environmentalist type talk, but I grew up camping. And this is my mother. My mother always said, we have to have, find a campsite with a stream. And it was just like this. So thank you, Taylor. Let's try. Bonnie, how about we do the next one? Let's see. Oh, I had, I had a story. Oh, do you I've, been, go? Oh, please. I've been to the, the very headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay um, where in Cooperstown, New York, where the um, Baseball Hall of Fame is. So that's where the Susquehannock starts. And um, and the top right there looks very similar to this. So, um, um, oh, cool that you've to been go. to the furthest corner of the bay. Can't get any further up. That's it. Oh, and, and even cooler to think how we're all connected by these threads. And you could draw the line from where you are in Baltimore down the Patapsco and up the Chesapeake Bay and up the Susquehanna. There you'd be in Cooperstown. Right. Right. Let's do another one. We've moved downstream and you feel the water is flushed out. We're in the tidal bay now on a big open river. Does anyone have feelings that this image brings up or stories they'd love to share? A moment they've had with a river or a creature as part of the river? The image reminds me of river otters, which I don't see very often, but it does remind me of them. Feel like I could almost see it swimming past. Reminds me of upstate New York, uh, some of those lakes up there. 
um, like 13th Lake, Little Tupper Lake, uh, that you can only access by boat, uh, non-motorized boat. So you have to paddle up. Your campsites are spread apart almost a half a mile away from each other. And there's absolutely no sound except the sound of nature. No, no motorboats allowed. Uh, very beautiful. Isn't Quiet that place. silence something special? Yeah. And uh, loons are very prevalent there and quite a stunning song that they have. It is an unbelievably stunning song. And for those of you who live closer to the open bay, which will be one of our next ones, we have loons who come down in the winter. They're just arriving right now. So you won't really hear them in the winter, but if you keep your eyes open, you might catch a glimpse of one of your friends from New York down here for the winter. And I see one in the chat. I would love to kayak there. Oh boy, do I agree with that. I'm a canoeer myself, but boy, I agree with that. And I love that we have a reference to the St. Lawrence River too. Yeah. The only tidal estuary bigger than the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> wow. Well, this picture reminds me of all the songs I sang growing up. All the songs I sang growing up about rivers and um, there just must be thousands of songs about rivers. They're so inspiring and they keep coming to me. So someday you might ask Simon to do some river songs. He has about a whole hour and a half of river songs. <laughs> Simon has come and performed at an event I ran on the Eastern shore alongside with Ruth Ann and some others. You have to hear his voice in person. It is amazing. I'm going to give him a shout out. <laughs> oh, here's a beautiful one. We've come out of the river and we're on the open bay. Water almost as far as you can see, but you can see. <laughs> this one just looks like home to me. I grew up, my dad was a recreational fisherman and it, like we went fishing all the time. The first time I was on the boat, I was like two weeks old. And I spent so much time on the open bay, like one of my earliest memories is falling asleep on the bow of our boat while my dad was hooked up on a black drum. And I was asleep for long enough and he was fighting the black drum for long enough that I would wake up and I would just see my dad still fighting the fish and I'd be like, ah, oh, I need to go back to sleep. But I was just so comfortable in the boat and being on the open bay just will always feel like my happy place. It's like always going to be my home. never ceases to amaze me how much life is out there too in the open bay. You look at the, the water itself, it, it, it takes the right eye, it takes the right moment, the right pause to really start to see how much is out there. Molly and her family recently took our whole IPC staff out on the water, uh, chasing striped bass around and watching the birds feeding on them as the striped bass push menhaden up. Oh, we have another one, Molly, little fish. What a beautiful memory. Do we have other fishermen in the room, the people who enjoy being out in the water? Well, um, Walter was telling about his fishing life, and he has a lot of stories to tell about fishing. And I also have one of his cousins um, also traps along the bay, and he's got an incredible intuition about the animals that live around the bay. But personally, I'm fascinated by the bay in the sense that it, it's where the salt and the fresh water meet and it creates this totally different ecosystem that you know, I'm not a scientist so it's just fascinating to me that fresh water and salt water meet and create a new way of being for a whole nother set of animals. That's just like a great mystery to me. <laughs> Oh, here's a special one. Let's take a look for a second at where our people and our water and our land all come together. It's a huge portion of our watershed. We have 18 million people in the watershed, and I think it's about 15 or 16 million of them are right on the water <laughs> or very close to it. I'll share a story first because I, I thought about this one the most. I live in 
a fairly urban section of Annapolis, uh, just behind the Annapolis Mall, if you're familiar with, with our region at all. And a very large parking lot drains behind my parking lot, uh, behind my apartment into a very large reservoir, very large settlement pond. And the first thing I noted when I moved into this apartment was 50 feet on the other side of my building. My rent would have been $200 higher for the privilege of looking at a parking lot and the other apartment building in my complex. And for $200 less, I look at a water filled pond and a wood lot behind my house, all because it was 100 feet extra to walk. And I think that's so funny. But my pond is very interesting to me because it's teeming with life despite it. It, it should not necessarily be filled, filled with life. It's truly full of parking lot storm water that pours in after storms. I watch my pond go up and down about 10 feet in any given rainstorm because it's draining so much parking lot. But my friends across the street at Petco, I believe, put goldfish in the pond, or someone put goldfish in the pond, but Petco is right there. And now there are thousands of invasive goldfish in the pond, which is a problem and not a great thing, but it does attract a huge amount of wildlife. I see foxes and raccoons fishing in it. I have constant herons, night herons, egrets, kingfishers, ospreys, all fishing in my pond for those goldfish constantly throughout the day. And that's what I watch with my coffee. And so it might be a settlement pond. It might be a man-made structure that never would have been there. Ideally, it would have been a beaver pond back in the day. But that's my pond, and that's the water that I look at every day. I wanted to share that. Well, I, I just have to jump in since I'm hearing that you're in Annapolis. And right now, as we speak, uh, Chief White Otter is at the Naval Academy in Annapolis making a presentation for their Native American Heritage Banquet. And they have a newly formed Native American club at the Naval Academy. And they have decided to take on as their very first um, project, restoring the name of Taminant. And I don't know how many of you know that story, but there was a statue of Taminant at the front gate of the Naval Academy because George Washington claimed he was to be the patron saint of America because he was such a diplomat. Um, but somebody decided they didn't want a diplomat, they didn't want a peacemaker, and they changed his name, they changed the, the signage on his statue to be a warrior. And they've recently restored his name and restored his story. And he is the one who said, uh, who adopted the William Penn family and said, we will live together as one family as long until the rivers no longer run. So that is the gift of Taminant to the city of Annapolis, that we will live together well as family until the rivers no longer run. What what a time frame is that? Like that's that's like the biggest time frame I can ever imagine. I don't even know how long rivers have run or how long they will run. But that's his dream for us, the patron saint of America, that we would live together well as long as the rivers run. Oh, that's beautiful. That's quite a story. I hadn't heard that before. That was really beautiful. Awesome. I'd just like to point out something a little odd, maybe humorous. Uh, the building in the middle of this photo has got a neon set of waves. <laughs> I just think that's funny. That's, that's the, the National that's Aquarium. The aquarium. Oh, is that that's, what it is? So they, get a, they get a free pass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this this building is the aquarium. Yep. Oh, that's nice. But a good observation that how often do we take imagery from nature or, or from the water that we're right next to and apply it, but not actually connect it back? Because I, I do think you're on to something. I think it's but it is common. connected because it's at a, this time it is connected. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to welcome JT Johnson. He's a tribal citizen who's now on the call. He had some trouble getting in earlier. 
um, due to some personal um, family obligations. But he's here with us now. And he also studied with Chief Quiet Thunder. So I'm happy that he's on here. And um, Greg Vissi, who was just speaking about the waves on the building, he uh, is the uh, biographer of Chief Quiet Thunder. And if you'd like to learn about his book, um, you can send us a little note. I'm sure Taylor will help us connect people with that book. Happily, I would like to connect on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have one final final one to explore. It's, I think it's a very important one. And there's a reason we tacked on a little note at the bottom of this one. And Ruthann, I wonder if you want to open a little bit since we had talked so much about this on the side. For yes. Why, why we have this note on the bottom of our website. Well, slide. Yeah, so this is one of my biggest learning curves because I grew up thinking that swamps are dirty and you should try to stay clean and um, it's stinky and there's bugs that bite you and I didn't learn much good about swamps and then I uh, heard people saying that we need to clean up the swamp as a political action and and I really wanted to learn to honor and respect every aspect of creation. So learning more about the beauty of the marshes and the wetlands and the swamps has been a big learning curve for me. And it's been so good. Um, we actually have a Lenape Forest Garden project where we have Lenape citizen scientists being trained to restore um, our relationship with the wetlands and we have a freshwater wooded wetland at the um, when you go downhill from our garden we're in a freshwater wooded wetland and we're restoring the freshwater mussels there and learning what the ideal atmosphere is for them to thrive because they are filters and they clean the water so we're just learning so much and I also really honor those people that have learned to live in the wetlands and with the wetlands. It is an art form. It's an athletic art form. If you've ever spent much time in the in the wetlands and the marshes and the swamps, so it's, it's another one of those big mysteries for us to learn, learn, learn about. Thank you. <clears throat> I think wetlands for me elicit a more sacred and special feel than any other ecosystem. You can think there's a lack of silence to them that's spectacular. I just you can feel the presence of so many creatures and so much life all around you. And yet it is silent. It is a relatively silent space, save for the occasional fish breaking the surface and the crickets and katydids in the trees. It really is my my little space. Uh, Greg, you're talking about paddling in a remote lake. That's the same feeling that I get here. And it was wonderful to hear you talking with the same feeling that for me, we're going to come up on this slide. And I'm sure that's true for so many in the room that one of these slides did elicit that feeling for you. No, special, special place. Oh, thank you very much for sharing that at the bottom. Uh, folks, it, there's a, a link that was just put in the chat. Taylor, I just want to echo you on the um, wetlands. And I want to tell everybody about a special log. Um, I live on the marshy hope on Bachelors Creek and I go paddleboarding all the time. And one of the most incredible things moving here is this log that sticks out of the water in the marsh and it has all different sorts of flowers on it that I've been able to see as the seasons have changed and I've seen little bugs on the flowers and all sorts of little fish underneath of the log. I've even caught fish under the log. Um, it's just incredible to me that this like one log holds so much life on top of it, even though it's a deceased tree. It's just continuing to flourish and produce for so many other animals. So I also wanted to share that because like Taylor and Ruthann, these wetlands in the marsh, um, they mean like something so moving to me.
if anyone want to share any final thoughts or stories, emotions you felt on this or any of the past ones before we move on. It's been a treat exploring this with you all. Wonderful. Well, we have a short video now, a continuation of our first video from Chief Quiet Thunder uh, to bring us back into the moment of our, and center ourselves back on our place and specifically Chief Quiet Thunder's place. So I hope you I hope you enjoy. We'll watch this for a few minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Dick Quiet Thunder. I'm a Lenai Lenape Indian. I'm 77 years old. And today I'm going to tell you about my people and how they lived prior to European contact. I'll tell you how we measure time, how we measure travel, how we <coughs> teach our young, some of the things that was taught. But we're also going to have some fun. I'm going to have the kids beat the drums and shake the rattles, and I'm going to dress some of them up like animals and get the pictures taken. And periodically, I'll open the program up for questions. I hope when you walk around and look at some of the things that I've made uh, that you formulated some questions about these. I'd like to begin with subject that modern man has a lot of difficulty with. He either has too much or not enough. And it presents a real problem. It is called time. The Lenai Lenape did not measure time by years, months, weeks, days, hours, or minutes. They measured time by seasons. All things within a season. And I'd like to begin with what we call today late November, December, January, and parts of February. Now, this is when the weather would be at its severest, and the people would spend more time inside their wigwams. But it was a very important time. Because we didn't have a written language, we had to pass all of our knowledge on by word of mouth. It is called oral history. And on these cold, wintry days, there was a sound you could hear it throughout the forest. And you could always tell the direction of a Lenape village by this sound. of the clacking stones. And as they would sit in their wigwams, they would teach the young ones about the history of their tribe, about their leaders, the tribal laws, and the laws of the land. Tribal laws, such as, because the people lived close together, cooperation was essential for their survival. Question? Uh, I thought I saw that he put her in. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of a friend of, of one of my brothers. He was at Cowtown. This was years back. And how they auctioned the, the animals off. And he didn't know. And he was there roughly the street. <laughs> he bought several cows and a couple of goats. And he didn't know anything <laughs> Materials, whether they're traditional materials or whether they're something. Well, today, else. this is called a ribbon shirt. It's pretty, pretty much international with, with Indian people. But we didn't, this wasn't something that we were prior to European contact. Now, this time of year, we would wear buckskin or deer skin breeches, and the top would also be made from deer skin. And uh, your reach cloth would be deer skin. But this type of fabric we didn't, that came much later. <laughs> Today we wear this because we think we're gussy up. <laughs> and the turtle? Because the turtle is so important to us, it goes back to Toronto. And my tribe is the uh, tribe. Symbolized by the turtle. So the turtle is part of the medicine. 
I hope you can go away with the understanding that we are all brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not. If my arrows define those markings, red, yellow, black, and white, side by side, that represents four races on Mother Earth, side by side, as I believe the Creator has meant for it to be. I've had some say, Dick, that's a pretty utopian idea. Why not? Why not think that way? Why not think positive? So, uh, sadly, Walter had to leave. Uh, he's been suffering a lot lately, and it was an absolute miracle that he was able to be here with us tonight. And he sends his greetings and says he would ha be happy to play the flute for you next time when he's feeling better. How do we incorporate place-based spirituality into our own practices? And what does it mean to be place-based with our intentions and our actions? I think we've touched on that in so many ways tonight. But I would like us to each think just for a moment about the teachings that we grew up with. Where did they come from? When we practice spiritual traditions from other places, when we learn the parables, the word pictures, the analogies from other worlds, from other lands, some of them don't speak to us as loudly as all creation right here, right now in this place. Once I lived on an island in Indonesia, I was practicing how to learn languages. And uh, I lived with some people who were translating the Bible into the indigenous languages of that island. And they didn't know what to do because the people didn't know what sheep were. They'd never seen sheep. And they didn't have any uh, electricity or electronics they wouldn't have learned from the television. So what is a sheep and what is a shepherd? That analogy didn't work for them. But there were analogies that worked for them from their own island and their own life. There were creatures that took care of each other. There were shepherds, as it were, of the people who were pastoral and nurturing. There were midwives. There were all different people and analogies for them that were right from their place. So how can you, as people reflecting with us today, Find those analogies that speak loudly to you, that both ground you and allow you to flow more freely in your own place, in your own world, with your own integrity, as you choose your intentions and your actions to live together well with all living things. Thank you so much, Ruthann. This has been a true privilege to explore this with you and get to tie in IPC's own mission to help support sacred waters across the bay. And I want to I wanna move now to offer a going forth message. And that we do have a lot that we can do now. And IPC is committed to helping you to identify further with your place and to help your congregation to find value in the waters in your backyard, whether it's a puddle, a stream, a river, open bay, a marsh or swamp or urban waters, there is water everywhere and it is a thread that connects us all. And we do have a resource that fits perfectly with our, web, with our webinar tonight that we would like to share with you and that we've talked with Ruth Ann about expanding further into the future. So please keep your eye open. But here on our website, on our resources page, we have a variety of action kits, we call them. And Bonnie, if you will, that link works, and I'd love you to show people where they could find this 
wonderful resource, which is a water a blessing or an interactive blessing for your waterway so that you can go out with your community, with your faith leadership, with your green team, and that you can then take, take not ownership, but that you can take a stance on knowing your water and helping people understand it better. So I really encourage all of you to explore this blessing and explore it as a potential way that you can engage your own congregation on place-based spirituality and identifying with your water and your watershed. So thank you, Bonnie, so much for showing it. Let me go back. Uh, I do want to say um, yes, we please. are we are lining up our Chesapeake conversations for the next year, and our intention is that um, for April, um, which is Earth Month, uh, that many people at different congregations will use this action kit and and go and do a, find the closest waterway to their congregation and use this action kit and do a blessing of their water near them. Um, so uh, stay tuned for more of that. Um, we'll, we'll have a panel discussion with different water keepers from around the, the Bay region. And then hopefully you all can plan an activity with your congregation. So we're giving you plenty of time to plan. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to use that resource in April. And we can all be doing this in different places at the same time, similar times. And I will commit to recording um, a blessing in the Lenape language, and then I'll meet with a friend of mine and see if I can learn to sing a water blessing in the Piscataway language. So. Wow, that would be a privilege to share with everyone. Yes. Well, it's time now to conclude, and we're so thankful that you could all join us here in taking a stance to make a, to make a true difference for our home, both collectively and individually. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, and certainly Ruth Ann's too. We really appreciate that you could all be here with us tonight. Wanishi, wanishi. And we'll have a few minutes here at the end that we've tagged on that if, if you would like, uh, we can do a little bit of a Q&A here with Ruth Ann up until about eight o'clock and then we'll depart. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in unmute the chat. yourself. Yes. I don't know how many I can answer, but I certainly have enjoyed being here. And thank you so much for recording, Walter. We don't know how long we'll have him. He's so special to us. and. And Chief Quiet Thunder has been so special to us. So thank you for sharing with, with us all these richnesses that we have. Thank you, Ruth Ann. I did want to note that um, this